Cannabis Common Sense, the show that tells the truth about marijuana and the politics behind its prohibition. Hello and welcome to another exciting edition of Cannabis Common Sense. We have a lot of hip news to catch up on tonight and some great science articles to wrap that up with. And our guest tonight is Joav Eladi, who is a cannabis researcher from Israel, who's uh, just working on a cannabis encyclopedia in Hebrew. We're interviewing him in Brazil, where he's taking a little sabbatical and talk about his research on pathogens and other interesting topics. So stay tuned for that and stay tuned for our hip news segment. Uh, but as we always do, we're going to bring out our infamous dancing cannabis leaves. I feel the force. Okay, our first story tonight, marijuana reform activists in several states around the country are already working to qualify various statewide reform measures for the 2022 ballot. Here's a breakdown of the current statewide citizen initiated uh, efforts in several states and uh, some legislative work. In Idaho, first on a depenalization clause, in Idaho marijuana is a criminal offense, Idaho activists received the green light from the Secretary of State's office to begin collecting signatures for a proposed depenalization ballot initiative. If qualified, the measure would allow adults possess up to three ounces of marijuana on private property. The measure would not establish a regulated retail marketplace. Activists have until May 2022 to collect 65,000 signatures. And on medical marijuana, another group of Idaho activists was also cleared to begin collecting signatures in hopes of qualifying a separate medical marijuana measure for the 2022 ballot. The proposal would allow qualifying patients to access up to four ounces of medical marijuana with a physician's recommendation, as well as a permit uh, to allow home cultivation of up to six plants for therapeutic use. Our next story is in Missouri on legalization. Similar to the campaign to legalize medical marijuana in Missouri in 2018, Missouri residents could see several competing marijuana legalization measures on the state's 2022 ballot. Fair Access Missouri, one of the groups working to qualify marijuana reform ballot measures, has submitted several initiatives, at least one of which would legalize adult use marijuana in Missouri. New Approach Missouri, the proponents behind the successful medical marijuana initiative in 2018, also plan to qualify an adult use legalization measure for the 2022 ballot. In Nebraska, they're working on medical marijuana. After a 2020 medical marijuana measure was stripped from the ballot, advocates with Nebraskans for medical marijuana are once again working to qualify a ballot measure to legalize medical marijuana access in Nebraska. Nebraska's lawmakers considered legislation to legalize medical marijuana in 2021, but the bill was ultimately defeated. I even went back in, in 2017 to testify before the Nebraska Judiciary Committee. Nebraska has a unicameral legislature where every other state has two houses. But our next story is from Ohio, where they're working on a legalization measure. Opponents behind the effort, the coalition to regulate marijuana like alcohol, have submitted an initial slew of signatures in hopes of qualifying a statewide ballot measure that would push lawmakers to enact adult use marijuana legalization in Ohio. Once advocates collect 132,887 signatures, Ohio lawmakers will have four months to enact the reform. If the lawmakers fail to act, then another 132,887 additional signatures will be required to put the measure on the ballot before voters during the 2022 election. 
The proposed measure would allow adults to legally purchase and possess up to two and a half ounces of marijuana and grow up to six plants at home. Separately, two Democratic lawmakers in Ohio have introduced a bill to legalize cannabis for adult use. The move comes as cannabis legalization's own advocates launched their campaign to force the legislature to take up the reforms or put the issue on the ballot. The bill, backed by state representatives Casey Weinstein and Terrence Upchurch, would allow for possession, use, and cultivation of cannabis by adults 21 and older with a 10% excise tax on sales. The revenues derived from cannabis sales would be used for K-12 education, infrastructure, and up to $20 million per year for two years would be earmarked for clinical trials studying the efficacy of cannabis for medical conditions of veterans and preventing veteran suicide. In South Dakota, they're working on legalization. The proponents behind Amendment A, the 2020 ballot measure, which was overturned by a state court, have submitted four separate adult use legalization initiatives, but will only pursue them if the state Supreme Court upholds the decision of the lower court, nullifying Amendment A. Each of the four different approaches would legalize possession of up to four ounces of marijuana by adults, as well as the home cultivation of up to three marijuana plants. Some of the proposed measures would legalize commercial retail sales, others would not. The differences between the four approaches are if and when the measures are approved by state officials, proponents will need to gather at least 33,921 signatures for the constitutional measure and 16,961 uh, signatures for the statutory measure in South Dakota. Next, in Wyoming, there's a decriminalization push. Reform proponents in Wyoming uh, were approved to start gathering signatures for a proposal to remove the threat of jail time for adults who possess up to four ounces of marijuana in Wyoming instead of imposing a fine. Instead, it would impose a fine of $50 for the first and second offenders and $75 for subsequent offenders. Those caught growing marijuana at home would face a maximum $200 fine. Pretty good bill. Uh, another group's pushing for medical marijuana. Advocates in Wyoming were approved to begin collecting signatures for a medical marijuana ballot initiative which would permit qualifying patients to access up to four ounces of medical marijuana flour and up to 20 grams of medical cannabis derived products per 30 day period. Patients would also be allowed to cultivate up to eight mature cannabis plants at home for therapeutic use. The first step for advocates in the process is to collect a preliminary 100 signatures per initiative within a month. In Arkansas, Arkansas activists are collecting signatures to place adult use marijuana legalization on the state's 2022 ballot. The group Arkansas's True Grass is proposing a system of regulated sales for adults 21 and older, allowing them to purchase up to four ounces of cannabis and grow up to 12 plants for personal use. There'd be no limit on possession if it's out of the public view. Regulators with the State Agriculture Department and Alcoholic Beverage Control Division would be responsible for overseeing the program and issuing marijuana business licenses. Brianna Bowling, a spokesperson for True Grass, says that the group's been collecting signatures for the measure since November of 2020 and currently has about 10,000 of the required 89,151 valid registered voter signatures that they'll need to turn in by July of 2022 in order to qualify for the ballot in Arkansas. Next door in Oklahoma, a lawsuit filed against the Oklahoma Medical Marijuana Authority accuses the agency of violating the state's Open Meetings Act. The plaintiffs allege that the board, without public input, passed new emergency regulations for the cannabis industry. The lawsuit named OMMA Director Kelly Williams and her secretary and new members of the Board of Health and Food Safety Standards. Attorney Ron Durbin, who filed the lawsuit, and his co-counsel on the case, Rachel Bissett, said the rules were enacted despite there being no agenda posted, no outreach to the state's cannabis community, and that the members voting on the rules were given little time to read them. Durbin also filed a separate lawsuit in April challenging the implementation of the metric seed to sale tracking system claiming it would allow for a monopoly and you'd like to see OMMA move from under the authority of the state health division and under the purview 
of the Oklahoma Bureau of Narcotics. Here in, Was here in Oregon, across the river in Washington, the Washington State Liquor Control and Cannabis Board had issued an interpretive statement regarding the conversion of hemp-derived CBD into Delta-9 THC by licensed adult-use cannabis processors. The statement, which was drafted by the Washington State Liquor and Cannabis Control Board staff in consultation with counsel from the Washington State Attorney General's Office, hinges on the safe harbor doctrine, the legal term describing the practice of allowing for the production and distribution of a federally prohibited controlled substance, in this case, cannabis. The statement says under state law, only licensed cannabis producers or growers are granted safe harbor for creating Delta 9 THC, not cannabis processors. Specifically, the new interpretive statement says, quote, the statutes do not authorize a licensed processor to source hemp-based product such as legal CBD and convert it into Delta 9 THC, regardless of the method of production, nor are they licensed to process hemp into marijuana concentrate, end quote, the agency said in their statement. Quote, as conversion activity is not an identified privilege, it would not fall under the safe harbor protections, end quote. Justin Nordham, Director of Policy and External Affairs at the Washington State Liquor and Cannabis Control Board, confirmed that processors are, quote, not afforded safe harbor for the activities of creating Delta 9 THC. Only licensed producers may grow cannabis for that purpose. Processors are allowed to purchase Delta 9 THC from a licensed producer, but not create their own, end quote. In Puerto Rico, the governor there signed legislation into law protecting qualified medical cannabis patients from workplace discrimination, something we need here in Oregon and Washington. The legislation amends Puerto Rico's medical marijuana access law so that registered patients are now classified as members of a protected class under the U.S. Territory's employment protection laws. Under the expanded law, employers may not discriminate against authorized patients of medical cannabis in the recruitment, hiring, designation, or termination process or when imposing disciplinary action. Exceptions to the employee's protection include situations where, quote, the use of medical cannabis represents a real threat of harm or danger to others or property, or when the use of medical cannabis interferes with the employee's performance and functions, end quote, among other scenarios. Several U.S. states impose some similar degree of protection for workplace discrimination for qualified medical cannabis patients. Those states include Arizona, Arkansas, Connecticut, Delaware, Illinois, Maryland, Massachusetts, Minnesota, Montana, New Jersey, New Mexico, New York, Oklahoma, Pennsylvania, now Puerto Rico, Rhode Island, South Dakota, Vermont, Virginia, and West Virginia. But in the states that first legalized marijuana here in Oregon, across the river in Washington, in Colorado, in California, and Nevada, no, we have no employment protections. Contact your state legislators here in Oregon, Washington, Colorado, California, and Nevada and urge them to enact protection in employment for adult marijuana users. Down south, a new Louisiana law took effect on Sunday, August 1st, eliminating the possibility of jail time for low-level marijuana possession offenses. House Bill 652 amends the state law so that offenses involving the possession of up to 14 grams of marijuana are punishable by a fine of no more than $100, no arrest and no jail time. The fine penalty remains in place regardless of whether the offender has any prior marijuana convictions. Enhanced penalties and jail time remain in place for repeat offenders who are convicted of possessing more than 14 grams of marijuana in the state of Louisiana. Governor John Bell Edwards signed the partial decriminalization measure into law in June. According to an analysis conducted by the Southern Poverty Law Center, African Americans are arrested for low-level marijuana violations in Louisiana at three times the rate of white people. Uh, in some cities, like Baton Rouge, blacks are arrested for violating marijuana laws, marijuana laws at six times the rate of whites. 32 states and the District of Columbia have passed legislation either legalizing 
are decriminalizing the possession of marijuana for adults. In the world of sports, the World Anti-Doping Agency is making clear that the United States has played a key role in placing marijuana on the list of prohibited substances for international athletes, and it still has a seat at the table if it wants a policy change. In a letter to Representatives Jamie Raskin and Alexandria, Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez, who recently reached out to the WAD about the suspension of U.S. runner Shah Karee Richardson over a positive cannabis test. The global organization provided background on why marijuana was included in the banned substances list in the first place and explained why it couldn't unilaterally reverse the punishment. While the World Anti-Doping Administration consistently reviews and updates the prohibited drug list, it said decisions are made based on consensus among representatives of participating governments. It stressed that, quote, no time since the first prohibited list was published in 20, uh, 2004 has the, the organization received any objection from the United States stakeholders concerning the inclusion of cannabinoids on the prohibited list, end quote. In fact, the U.S. is responsible for cannabis prohibition around the globe. U.S. track and field also said last week that international policy on cannabis punishments for athletes should be reevaluated. Following Ocasio-Cortez and Raskin's letter, a separate group of lawmakers also sent a letter to the United States ADA on Friday to urge a policy change. Uh, 18 lawmakers wrote that, quote, we believe that cannabis does not meet the description of scientifically proven risk or harm to the athlete, and the U.S. ADA is perpetuating stereotypes and rhetoric fueled by the racist war on drugs by claiming its usage in private use and outside of competition violates the spirit of sport, end quote. Advocates have broadly embraced internal marijuana policy reform at other major professional athletic organizations, arguing they are long overdue, especially given the ever-expanding legalization movement. The National Football League's drug testing policy changed demonstratively last year as part of a collective bargaining agreement for players. Uh, under the policy, NFL players will not face the possibility of being suspended from games over positive tests for any drug, not just marijuana. In a similar vein, the um, uh, MLB for baseball decided in 2019 to remove cannabis from the uh, major league's list of banned substances. Baseball players can consume marijuana without risk of discipline but officials clarified last year that they can't work while under the influence and can't enter into sponsorship contracts with cannabis businesses, at least for the time being. Meanwhile, a temporary National Basketball League policy not to randomly drug test players for marijuana amid the coronavirus pandemic may soon become permanent, the league's top official said in December. Rather than mandate blanket tests, Commissioner Adam Silver said the league would be reaching out to players who show signs of problematic dependency, not those who are using marijuana casually." End quote. For what it's worth, a new poll from YouGov found that women are notably more likely to oppose Richardson's suspension from the Olympics and the U.S. Olympic team than men are. Now on to the latest cannabis science news. This first one's great. The United Kingdom uh, National Health Service and brain tumor charity are partnering on research to determine whether cannabis-based medicine Sativex paired with chemotherapy medication Timozolamide uh, can treat glioblastoma, a recurrent brain tumor. Once underway, it will be the first such study of its kind in the world. Sativex is one of three cannabis-based medicines used in Britain's National Health Service. It's currently given to patients with multiple sclerosis and condition has not improved despite treatment. Susan Short, a professor of clinical oncology and neuro-oncology at Leeds University and the lead investigator of the study said that cannabis drugs, quote, may kill glioblastoma tumor cells and it may be particularly effective when given with timozolamide chemotherapy, end quote. Professor Short went on and said, quote, it may enhance the effect of chemotherapy treatment in stopping these tumors growing allowing patients to live longer. That's what we want to test in this study, Professor Short said. 
The Brain Tumor Charity is funding the clinical trial and will recruit 232 patients early next year from at least 15 hospitals, including specialist cancer centers across the United Kingdom. Two-thirds of the study participants will receive Sativex and Timolazomide, uh, while the remaining will be given the chemotherapy drug and a placebo. The trial follows an earlier phase one trial involving 27 patients that investigated the safety of giving Sativex and Timozolomide together. Dr. David Jenkinson, the Brain Tumor Charity's interim chief executive, called those early stage findings, quote, really promising. We hope this trial could pave the way for a long-awaited new lifeline that could help offer glioblastoma patients precious extra months to live and make their memories with their loved ones, end quote. Participants in that phase one trial were given Sativex and they were still alive a year later than those who had been given the placebo. Our last story tonight is from San Diego. HIV positive patients who consume cannabis on a daily basis possess lower levels of neuroinflammation as compared to non-use, according to data published in the Journal of International Neuropsychological Society. Investigators with the University of California in San Diego evaluated the relationship between cannabis and central nervous system inflammation in a cohort of patients with and without HIV. The researchers reported that HIV-positive subjects who consume cannabis daily possessed lower levels of chronic inflammation than did HIV subjects who abstained from marijuana. Further, users' results were similar to those of HIV-negative subjects with no history of cannabis use. Daily, consu me, daily consumers also achieved better measurements of cognitive performance than did those HIV patients with no history of regular cannabis use, a finding that's consistent with prior analysis of HIV-positive patients. The authors concluded, quote, taken together, findings are consistent with the notion that cannabinoids may modulate inflammatory processes in patients with HIV, specifically the central nervous system, and suggests that a link between lower central nervous system inflammation and better neurocognitive function, future studies with patients with HIV are needed to investigate potential distinct effects of separate cannabinoids in adult medicinal use on brain structure and function, end quote. This study, daily cannabis use, is associated with lower CNS inflammation in people with HIV, appears in this month's edition of the Journal of the International Neuropsychological Society. That is the end of our hemp news segment tonight. If you or a loved one are looking for help finding a doctor to qualify or obtain a medical marijuana permit, we can refer you to patients, our doctors, all across the country. Just call our office. Our office number is 503-235-4606. Again, if you're looking for a doctor to help you uh, get a medical marijuana permit anywhere in the U.S. of A., call us at 503-235-4606. Now we have Yoav Ilati, who is in Brazil, but he is an Israeli researcher on cannabis pathogens or diseases that attack the cannabis plant. So stay tuned and help us restore him. Good night. I have the great pleasure of having Yoav Ilati. In, he's an Israeli citizen, but he has been in Brazil and he is a uh, cannabis researcher uh, who has been studying the pathology of cannabis or cannabis diseases of cannabis. Uh, he's worked closely from uh, Hebrew University with uh, the discoverer of THC. You want to, let's talk about your life, Yoav, to start with. Tell us how you became interested in cannabis. Well, uh, it was back uh, 15 years ago, I started the, the gorilla, gorilla group started the guerrilla growing scene in Jerusalem back in the days and uh, I've been uh, studying it in the university. I learned biology and then uh, second degree genetics and breeding. Uh, afterwards, uh, I found myself in the States. After Burning Man, I arrived and uh, 
started growing uh, industrial cannabis, also known as hemp, uh, back in 2014. And uh, growing since then, basically every year more and more, and advising all over the world. And uh, like you said, the plant pathology, that's my expertise. I uh, discovered uh, in 2018 a virus that uh, affects cannabis. Uh, it's called BCTV. I'm sure we're going to talk about it later on today. And uh, yes, a cannabis enthusiast and uh, also pushing for cannabis legalization in my country. And uh, cannabis is basically my life, Paul. Well, we share that passion, I know. I, I had the great pleasure of uh, uh, meeting you here in Portland a couple of years ago, and we ran out to our, our little uh, garden out in Hood River. And I remember you yes, were talking about being particularly da a danger for transmitting a specific disease that you've been studying. Yes, uh, well, there are many diseases uh, regarding. Yeah, there are many diseases regarding cannabis. Uh, my expertise is plant viruses, and uh, I know you published an article recently. Uh, you want to tell us the article? Yeah, well, I, it was a year ago I published the, the bit curly top virus, which is a virus that is common in the United States for, I don't know, more than 50 years now. And it affects mainly sugar beets, but they also affect more than 30 different plant families. It has a, a wide variety of hosts. And I identified the single variant of that virus that affects cannabis. And uh, we published it on a plant disease. It was a joint venture of uh, folks from uh, Colorado State University and uh, the Technion in uh, Haifa and the Volcanic Center in Israel. And uh, I really want, to, first of all, to thank Whitney Crenshaw from uh, the Plant Pathology Department in Colorado State University and all the researchers that helped identify this uh, virus. And I think it is the, probably the deadliest virus uh, to cannabis known so far. It really has a harsh consequences. I have already seen crop failures in uh, several fields in Colorado of industrial hemp. And uh, yeah, we identified the, the virus. I can tell about the process, how we did it, but uh, we tried to get this information out as fast as possible. And this was published very fast. All the reviewers gave it a thumbs up. And uh, yeah, it's been, uh, published more than a year ago, and now it's already cited six times, and uh, there's currently an outbreak in Arizona of this uh, Bitcoin virus that was already published, and uh, yeah, it's interesting to see what's gonna happen in the future. So, uh, how is that affecting Brazil? Is that, I know Brazil doesn't have a regulated medical, do they have medical marijuana or, uh, and they have hemp, don't they? Uh, no, there's no hemp industry here. I'm, I'm here only on a sabbatical. I'm not uh, involved in the local industry here, just uh, taking time off. Uh, but uh, yeah, you know, I'm uh, more concentrated on, uh, I come from Israel, the, they are more involved in the cannabis and the industrial hemp industry. So tell us about the situation in, in Israel for medical marijuana, recreational marijuana. Well, in uh, Israel, there was, Israel a, there was basically the industry started 10, 15, 10, 12 years ago with a handful of companies uh, supplying for 10,000 patients, then 30,000. Now the number is uh, 100,000 medical patients with license. And uh, now the, the cannabis is issued in uh, 
pharmacies, it used to be directly to the customer, now it's in pharmacies, the quality is uh, getting better and better, many international uh, companies, many, mainly from Canada, that are involved in the industry and uh, I think the most interesting thing about the Israeli cannabis uh, industry is the research. Uh, there are many research institutes, universities that are researching several different aspects of the plant and the medicinal use. So that is, that's what makes Israel special because, you know, people know how to grow cannabis in the States, in Canada, in Europe. Uh, but uh, the research, that what uh, really defines Israel. Back from the days of Rafi Meshulam, uh, as you know. I think it really paved the way for uh, all the legalization, basically, just to have scientific facts but backing the medicinal aspects of cannabis. You want to talk about his work and, and how he paved the way? I think it's uh, well published, but uh, the his first. Yeah, it's first, published, but yeah, yeah. Okay, so the first breakthrough was uh, back in uh, the '60s. I think '63, uh, where Rafi basically purified for hash that he got from the police. He purified the different uh, cannabinoids, uh, separated them, and made the. Uh, preclinical trials really to identify which one of these cannabinoids is the psychoactive one. It is the psychoactive one and he identified that it's THC and that uh, also he showed the correct molecular structure and the metabolic pathway from CBG to THC. That was the first uh, discovery and then 20, 25 years ago, after the receptor, the cannabinoid receptor, the CB1, was identified, I think, in the States, then Rafi found the endocannabinoid that actually binds to this receptor. So, really, uh, in covering this and realizing... Oh, this, the cannabis mimics, right? Yeah, the anandamide and 2-AG and uh, the rest of these endocannabinoids that are naturally produced in our bodies and affect the endocannabinoid system. That's the biggest breakthrough. It's the, and that's what will eventually yeah, give him the Nobel Prize, hopefully. Nobel Prize, hopefully. Yeah, in brain research and, and the nervous system research in our lifetime. Really, uh, he should get a Nobel Prize for that. You know, I think. Definitely. I agree, Paul. So you got to meet him and work with him there in Jerusalem at Hebrew University. Well, I haven't actually worked with him at his lab. I just, for me, basically, I have this big project of writing the Hebrew cannabis encyclopedia. So I gave him the book that I wrote, so he will review it. And it was a big achievement. To, and he basically gave, gave us a lot of feedback, good feedback and also bad feedback, and just to, to shake us up. And uh, he threw us back to, for two more years of writing after he, he read the book. And uh, it was a great accomplishment. In the end, Rafi gave us the thumbs up and he recommended our books. So, I'm really thrilled, uh, and uh, yeah, that's that's what I'm doing basically now, just writing and accumulating all the knowledge and translating it to Hebrew. Yes. Okay. So, um, what's your what's been the impact of your article on this uh, plant? disease and, and what is the name of that disease again it's called bctv the bit curly top virus this bit curly top virus is uh, like i said it was just the first report you know it's the first report of the virus we haven't done the core test yet and the full article 
this will take time. Just, uh, just raising awareness for people to understand that there's several variants now of this virus that affects cannabis. This, uh, the discovery was made in the North Fork Valley in Delta County, Colorado. This valley is known as an agricultural hub for crops like uh, palisade peaches or later corn and the sugar beets, which was a big crop back in the days. And there was, uh, for me, back, uh, being a student, we used to read about how, how many trials were made in order to find resistance for this curly top virus that's affecting sugar beets and uh, now seeing that this deadly disease also can transmit to cannabis is just it's awful news and, uh, and seeing how the plant reacts when, once it's being uh, inoculated with the disease it loses all of its chlorophyll the plant basically becomes pale and cannot produce sugars becomes stunned and no yield whatsoever. Tiny flowers, often. And uh, so this disease is transmitted. That's the horrible news. But the, as a, if you compare it to other viruses, it is not that uh, transmittable. You know, you cannot transmit it uh, with your own hands. It has to be transmitted by a single uh, vector, which is an insect. It's a cicada called the, the beet leaf hopper. And uh, so that's the good part. And it also does, it's not transmittable through seeds at the moment from what we've seen, as opposed to other viruses that, are, that can be transmitted through seeds. So uh, at the moment, every year it's different. Because the this virus is, as I mentioned, is transmitted with, from the beet leaf hopper. This insect migrates from New Mexico and Mexico all the way north towards the Rockies, and it, multipli it multiplicates a few times throughout the way. It it, it eats the perennial plants, and uh, there are several years where you don't see you see few plants that are affected and there are years like 2019 where you see entire fields with 30 or 70 percent of the plants gone so it's a matter of luck and just is there any is there any sort of uh, treatment or way to to deal with the the leaf hoppers and the virus Yeah, like you mentioned, there are two ways, two approaches. Either you deal with the leaf, ho leaf hopper itself, uh, which it ca it's an airborne insect. It comes, it migrates with the wind. So it doesn't affect greenhouse or indoor cultivation at all. Uh, it's only an outdoor open field disease. That's uh, so installing nets or growing in places where it's not the migrational route of the insect that's those are few possibilities and uh, from the plant perspective finding uh, natural immunity or resistance to the virus that's a possibility and also biotechnological crops that uh, were genetically edited in order to get uh, immunity for the virus that's a different approach so at the moment I haven't seen a single uh, single uh, cannabis plant that is, has resistance. This uh, virus affects broadleaf and narrowleaf cannabis the same. So do you have plans now have plans to deal with the cannabis with industry the cannabis anywhere industry, in the world or in Israel, in, world specifically? Or in Israel specifically? As I mentioned, I'm here on a sabbatical. I'm, uh, writing my book, The Cannabis Encyclopedia, was gonna, it's gonna be published in November. And uh, I'm always up for seeing any cannabis plant and giving advice, that's my passion. And I travel all over the world just uh, 
seeing the different industries, the different uh, varieties of cannabis, growing methods. That's my passion. So you're available for consultation. Let me ask you, tell us Always. You your book, The Cannabis Encyclopedia, that's coming out in November. Yes, well, this book really summarizes all the up-to-date knowledge about cannabis, about the genetics of the plant, different cultivation methods, extraction, isolation, and also all the folklore and the different bureaucratic uh, uh, rules, and just summarizing all the knowledge about cannabis. You know, cannabis plant has notorious uh, name on, on one hand on the other hand people claim it cures every cancer so between these lies you need to come out with the with the truth with the facts talking about the facts that's the most important just spreading the knowledge for everyone and this will be the first uh, book in hebrew what this book is written in Hebrew, my uh, mother tongue language, and it will be the first book in Hebrew regarding all the aspects of cannabis. Is there any plans to translate it? At the moment, we're keeping it uh, in the language of the Hebrew man, and afterwards, maybe in the future. There are lots of uh, books in English very good ones, but uh, in Hebrew, there are none. I see. So, uh, what do you have planned now? What are, what are you going to work on after your book's published? After the sabbatical, I will continue roaming the world, looking for new opportunities and uh, that's it basically that's taking that's it, it easy. Basically. Taking it easy. If someone is interested in reaching you and reaching out to you about consulting or anything else, is there a website or email you'd like to to promote? No, um just need to approach me personally. Uh, thanks for offering but uh, yeah, I'm good at the moment. Yeah the cannabis industry is evolving as uh, uh, so many opportunities. Well, I guess we're about wrapped up here. I want to thank you for coming on. We've had Yoav uh, Ilati, who's in Brazil. Yoav but Ilati, yeah. Citizens, is there anything you'd like to say in closing, Yoav? Yes, Paul, I want to thank you personally for promoting cannabis legalization in Oregon and in the States and paving the way for this renaissance. Thank you so much. My pleasure. Thank you. It's good seeing you here in Oregon a couple of years ago and hope you can get back here sometime. Look forward to seeing you out there on the, the Hempen Trail. Looking forward to Thank you so much, Paul. My pleasure. Thank you. Olá pessoal, eu sou Joab Guiladi, de Terra Santa, aqui no país tropical, agora. E agradeço muito pela oportunidade de partilhar meus conhecimentos com vocês. Então, bora lá! Hello, my name is Joab Guiladi, and today we're going to talk about plant viruses. And more specifically, about a single virus that I discovered back in 2018 and is influencing the industrial cannabis market. The name of the virus is BCTV. It's a single strand DNA virus and it is transmitted by an insect, a leaf hopper. The damage caused by this disease is enormous. It is now spreading all across the United States and uh, there's an outbreak in Arizona that was just reported. The way I discovered this virus was a long journey. It took me at least four years 
from the first time I saw the virus and then the consecutive year I saw it again and then took a few years to get all the paperwork and the authorization to send it to the laboratory and to get the results but once we purified the DNA and took all the ribosomal DNA out of the plant material we could identify everything that wasn't plant DNA and this was the viral DNA and uh, all the work was done by uh, Lior Haddad at Aviv's lab and uh, we understood after doing the RNA sec and assembling this that it is the bit curly top virus a different variant of the virus that affects cannabis and uh, you can see that the symptoms are very unique to this disease it's a rugged mosaic pattern that spreads all across the leaf and goes from the interior part of the leaf outwards basically the plant loses its chlorophyll and the ability to create sugars and eventually we're getting a stunt plant that is not functioning properly not going to produce a lot of cannabinoids and in industrial crops we are seeing crop loss and a lot of yield that is just being cut from the otherwise healthy plants so this disease as i mentioned is spread by a leaf hopper which is a migratory insect migrates from northern Mexico all across the Rockies and uh, it's spreading the disease whether it's uh, acquiring the disease from other insects or already coming from the, with the disease needs more research but uh, this insect is not a common cannabis pest it doesn't cause damage to the plant itself but uh, only transmitting the virus itself so this is an initial discovery and it needs further research in order to understand uh, and to be prepared in other states like my country this uh, disease never arrived yet and so we need to be prepared for it and uh, same goes with Brazil I haven't seen uh, yet this variant of the virus arriving here so People need to be keen and aware because in the future there will be a cannabis industry in Brazil like all over the world. And uh, this was my discovery. Thank you so much for your time. I appreciate it. And agradeço muito. Obrigado por tempo. Gracias a vocês. It's a little song for the, for the drug war.
war's over Unless you gotta be that lie, that same old lie War's over So for God's sake, let's get high Plant make the best medicines on earth. 
helps cancer and ace patients eat their food Helps those with depression overcome the blues Overcome the epilepsy, nausea, insomnia, stress, neurosis, psychosis, pink PMS All the studies have been done and all the doctors agree But they can't make money off this plan to see Cause it's free, it grows from a seed of water and free life We ought to be, you know the future is grown in our own backyards But if we cut down all the trees, we won't have no This one single plant can bring us back 10,000 years in history To the Shiva Puranas, the Jesus, the Christ, to the Buddha, the pagans, the goddess, the light To commune with all the animals, be one with all the trees To realize the goddess seek us inside me As the earth is the mother, we gotta take care of the earth The earth is the mother that gives our birth And we can hear our own listen with a single green plant We can start right now But if we cut down all the trees, we won't have La 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 